Hey, yo, from the Kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the official podcast of the Free State of Lieber, where the road to the opt-out is paved exclusively within. I'm your host, Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the D program. We have a rather timely episode for the time frame that the yearly Gregorian calendar states we are in. It's the season the normies love because they think they've hit the jackpot with the small stipend their government grants them in return for another year of blind obedience. That's right, it is tax season, and who better to kick it with than David William, a California-based tax consultant who specializes in the education of income tax liability and what he calls lawful avoidance. I know we're all sick and tired of being chastised, swindled, and coerced into contributing a third of our income to things like chemical skies, clot shots, dual-use military tech, pizza and hot dogs, and our own spiritual enslavement. But, as David and so many others in the legal and lawful spaces point out, this is a completely contractual arrangement with an opt-in process you're not educated about and an opt-out process that your artificially intelligent TurboTax rep claims doesn't even exist in the first place. It's both the literal and proverbial deal with the devil in disguise at the crossroads and quite possibly the longest legal con in the history of contracts. So let's do the damn thing with David William and dig into this as best as we can from where we currently stand. Strap on those discernment caps nice and tight because yet another dose of consciousness enhancing audio is incoming right about now. Enjoy. David William, welcome to the Kingdom of Ohio in a little place I call Lieber. Thanks for stopping through my neck of the woods today. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. No problem. I am surprised I have not heard you on 40,000 other shows at this point that I listen to (laughs) that talk about lawful topics, because this is one of the most, I think, practical lawful topics that we could really talk about. And we have a lot of ground to cover here in a couple of hours or more, because When you start into the subject of the income tax, the tax code, the IRS, things get pretty hairy pretty quickly. And frankly, it's too intimidating of a terrain for most living men and women to explore. So our job here is to simplify and demystify this terrain. So by the end of the second hour, we'll have a better map to how we can both legally and lawfully avoid the terrain altogether. So before we get into all of that, we need to qualify you up front here because- yeah. As many people know, the lawful space is full of charlatans, snake oil salesmen, flat out con artists and criminals, and what's commonly known (laughs) around these parts as patriot mythologists. So we need to establish that you are not any of these types of people. So if you please tell us what it is you do and how and why you started doing it. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a uh, income tax consultant, a very alternate type of uh, tax consultant, as some of the people that you mentioned out there will put themselves out to be. I would just invite anybody. I mean, I would be very skeptical listening to somebody like myself. So the first thing I'd be like, what kind of results can you show me? What kind of documentation? And that kind of stuff is available at my website, which I think you're going to give a a link to uh, in the comments. I did a report back in 2017 just to try to reach the public. And and it's got some documented results of, uh, you know, what we do that's different from what a lot of the uh, folks you described, the alternate tax folks out there, is we actually produce uh, documented results of IRS agreement with uh, usually zero tax liability, but the lowest liability legally possible for uh, an individual. And in, in most cases, that does turn out to be zero dollars. Regardless of how much money they make, that's really not the issue. And that's what we'll get into. But that's the difference. I, I don't know of anybody that produces documented results like what we have showing that the IRS has agreed And then we go and get transcripts from years later just to show that nothing changed. You know, like the IRS agreed back in 2014 that such and such person had zero tax liability. And in 2021, we obtain a transcript to show that nothing ever changed. The IRS didn't go back and audit. Nothing bad happened with this guy. The other documentation that we have, it's not, uh, I I don't think I have this on the website, but I am revising the, uh, you know, these documents. I just very, very busy. So when I get around to it, but these, uh, these, what my process has survived IRS audits as well. And we'll get into that maybe in the second hour, I think, when we're talking about the actual results of what I do. But that's the difference. I think I, I can produce documented results where uh, you see some other folks maybe can produce a copy of refund checks. I think that's what Pete Hendrickson, if you know who he is, shows refund checks on his site as, as website as proof of uh, results. But uh, we'll, we'll get into maybe why that doesn't really, all that proves is that you got past the first level of of IRS because they can come back and audit a return three to six years after that, right? And that's where uh, those things can sometimes fall apart. But most of the uh, charlatans and patriot mythologists that you're talking about out there, their standard of evidence for like what is successful outcome is amazingly low. 
<laughs> they'll, they'll be like, well, uh, this guy, I, I did this and uh, I never heard from the IRS again. Honest. Seriously, I didn't. Hmm. I mean, and it's just uh, these apocryphal stories of somebody did something and they never heard from the IRS again. And that's not very scientific, you know. And it's also right. you hear stories where the opposite happens. Somebody just decided to quit filing for a few years and, you know, it seemed like they got away with it. And then the IRS came around and audited them for all of those years all at once. And, you know, they might not have gone to jail or anything like that. But the IRS's main goal is not to throw people in jail. Their job is to raise revenue and they can come after you forever. Anyway, so that that would be uh, the main difference between. Uh, what I do, I take a much more professional approach to this and uh, produce documented results for the client so that they know that what we've done uh, has worked. Yeah. So are you a lawyer? I am not a lawyer. Uh, I have a lot of self-study uh, legally. But what I do is more akin to what a lawyer would do than like your typical CPA or uh, you know tax preparer. Because uh, what we do is we navigate the legal aspects, which a CPA will not do for you. You go to a CPA and it's basically you just hand them a stack of documents, right? And they just, choo, 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 they figure out your deductions and then here's your tax bill, right? And none of the legal underpinnings are, are usually questioned. It's all about what deductions can I take to make my tax as low as legally possible, right? That's what everyone is trying to do. Literally everyone is trying to pay the lowest amount of tax legally possible. It's just what most people think is possible is uh, very limited. It's possible, and I've been doing it for a dozen years with clients, is getting the IRS effectively negotiating the lowest tax legally possible with the IRS, which is most often zero dollars. And that includes full refunds of, you know, all the withholding and things like that. I was going to say, I think that that is going to be a, a surprise and a shock to most people to hear that you can that you can actually not pay a cent to these people. Right. And we'll talk about why that is possible. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to point out something else though. First, you know, so in one of our email correspondences, you said you wanted to reshape the tax compliance industry to recognize and support the exercise of personal rights rather than being a tool for reinforcing collectivism, communism, totalitarianism, and wealth yes. redistribution. And you're certainly playing the right key for me personally there. That, that hits all my field spots. You also wrote in one of your eBooks on your website that you're not anti-tax or anti-government. And then this is more about being anti-fraud, anti-tyranny, and pro-liberty. And again, you're playing the right tune for me there. So I, I guess the best thing to do now is let's talk about what you call the legal scheme behind the creation of liability. I think we should probably get into the Internal Revenue Code here and just you know kind of lay this out. Like, okay. when, when did the racket start and, and what does the code actually say? Well, let's start with uh, what most of the what we call normies will assume about how the tax works. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's this, it's this magical thinking that somehow we, if you earn some money that automatically you now owe the IRS money. Okay. And and you're not meant to think about it any, any more deeply than that, but there's, but there's no magic to it. There's, there's a written law that is getting you from A to B. And when you start looking at how that process actually happens, you start to see, Oh, there's a little more recognition of my rights than maybe I thought. Okay, so that's that's the first thing to get through is there's no automatically owing anybody anything. There's a pr there's a procedure there where, you know, there's an assessment procedure that has to ha has to happen. And in the typical case, you know, that normie will call them that assumes that they automatically owe the IRS tax. It's a foregone conclusion. Then they go ahead and do their return and they fill it out and they report everything that they made. Right. Like you're supposed to do, they think. And then you send that in and they don't they never realize that they themselves have effectively sealed the deal on that liability. They created it with their signature by signing on the bottom line, like this is true under penalty of perjury. And on that return, it says that how much tax uh, liability they had and how much tax they owe. Or sometimes there's a refund. That's another thing that knocks me out. I, it's unbelievable how many you talk to so-called normal people, unlike myself, <laughs> but you talk to normal people and people that how many people insist that they don't pay any taxes because they get a refund back every year. I'm like, no, 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 no. Look, look, go look at your paycheck. <laughs> go look at your final paycheck for the year. You will see the total amount that was taken out. And you're only getting a small part of that back, usually. You know, but these people are under the delusion that because they got a refund that they're not paying taxes because they've been conditioned to think of paying taxes as like having to pay additional tax at the end of the year. Right. So the way it actually works, the creation of liability is uh, most most typically, like I said, somebody files a 1040 and uh, return as, as an individual, they report their income, and they're actually creating their own tax liability. That's typically how it happens. 
And then, you know, you have the people who kind of uh, we've all heard of that go, you know what, I don't think I'm going to file uh, tax returns anymore. And then we started to get into this this area of the, you know, the tax resistors and uh, the, the good normal people are conditioned to think that, well, those people are going to go to prison, you know. Like Mm -hmm. as if everybody that doesn't file a return gets rounded up. Now, I don't advocate refusing to file a return, but uh, I bring it up to say that, you know, these people believe that if you just refuse to file a return, then they can't hold you liable for any tax. And that's not true either. They've they've devised mechanisms where they can, you know, calculate a tax based on available information anyway. And this is how these people that seem to get away with not filing for a few years and will share their story. Hey, I haven't heard from the IRS in five years. Well. You know, that that doesn't mean they won't hear from the IRS. And when they do, there is no statute of limitations on the IRS's ability to assess tax on them based on available information. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So there does a, there's a default process in there as well for assessing a tax. You know, the, the designers of this system probably anticipated, you know, from the beginning that hey, you can have some people that kind of go, hey, you know what? I don't think I want to file a tax return. Maybe maybe I won't have to pay if I don't file. So, yeah, they, they thought of that. Let's talk about how the system actually works in, in terms of manufacturing liability, because that's really what happens. Uh, because fundamentally, you know, this belief that I talked about, how everybody uh, tends to believe that if you magically owe the IRS money. Well, that's impossible under our system of law, you know, for them to just come along and just take a chunk of your paycheck. There's something that doesn't feel right about that it, because it, it, it's not right. That's not how it works. That would be a form of involuntary servitude. And, and that's prohibited by 13th Amendment of, of our Constitution. And it also goes against the very fundamental relationship between uh, the American people and, and their country established by the Declaration of Independence. So somehow we've been all bamboozled for over a century into believing uh, that stuff's just uh, they don't have to they don't have to pay attention to that. You know, somehow we're all just being subjected to involuntary servitude and it just became legal somehow. And that's where you get this taxation is theft idea where people just think that it's just straight bullying, because in their experience, it is. They're too afraid to challenge the system because they think they'll get thrown in jail if they make the IRS mad, right? There's a difference between the way people think it works and the way it actually works in the law. But let's talk about how the system manufactures tax liability, okay, for most people. Let's just take your typical person working at a job, right? They will, uh, when they're hired, what do you have to give every employer when they hire you? Uh, a social security number. Yes. Mm-hmm. You ever tried to get hired for a job without giving a social security number? No. It's uh, it's not it's not easy for those who do try to do that because every employer out there is conditioned to think, oh, oh, I'm required to get that. And why do they think that? Because their tax professional is telling them that that's required by law. You have to do this or the IRS will come and raid your business and you'll be out of business if you know, if you don't go along with these things. So it's, they just blindly go along with it. They require a social security number from everybody they hire. Uh, they require them to complete a W-4 to tell them how much withholding to take out of their checks for income tax, right? And all this stuff is just assumed to be required by law. And effectively it is because an employer will just like, you know, if you challenge that, they'll go, oh, well, maybe you, you know, maybe you're not the right person for this job. And then you just can't find a job, right? So there's this element of duress going on there. And coercion, where if you want to work here, you got to provide that social security number. Well, that ends up being effectively permission for the employer to take out deductions for social security and for Medicare and also uh, for income tax. And so you're, without knowing it, people are being, um, I call it, they're being shanghaied into uh, participating in social security and Medicare programs. And as a consequence of that, they're also making themselves liable for income tax on their earnings where they wouldn't have been before. So it's there's a contractual element going on there. Makes sense. So far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, what it is, is you're forced to do it. Right. You don't really have a choice other than to just refuse the job. But then under the eyes of the law, it is assumed that you did have a choice. Well, like you, you gave the Social Security number that that must have been because you wanted to participate in these in these uh, Social Security and Medicare programs. When the truth is, uh, usually like nobody asked to participate in that. You're, it's just forced on you. There's a difference between how the law presumes things and uh, and what's actually going on. And then from there, the employer uh, will file a W-2 at the end of the year, right? Reporting all the deductions that they took out of your checks for Social Security and for Medicare and for income tax uh, and for state income tax, by the way. Have you ever wondered why, how it is that they take money, they take deductions? It's like you're being taxed four or five times on the same money. Yeah. 
Have you ever thought about how is that legal? Uh, every time I get paid. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought from my first paycheck. I was just like when I was 16 years old, I was like, what's going on here? How is it legal to tax me five times on the same money? Because you're giving permission to do it. It's, it. It is presumed that you have consented to that. That's the only way it can be legal. They can't take anything out of your check without your permission. That's how this country works. Involuntary servitude, you know, this is something that some people will try to, you know, rationalize or argue around. But there's no distinction between taking a chunk of your paycheck and, and forcing you to work for free for the time that it took you to earn that money. So there's substantively no difference there between that and, and uh, involuntary servitude. Now, it would be involuntary if they were actually, if the government were actually forcing you to do this. But it's not the government forcing you to do this. It's your employer that's forcing you to do this because they think it's required by law. So that's where the government uses the employer to do their dirty work. It's very much like what the government has done with the vaccines, you know, where they tried to say, you know, they tried to push it onto the employers, right? Right. Yeah, they could never quite get a mandate. They, certainly Congress couldn't pass a law saying that everybody has to get a vaccine. And they tried the OSHA mandate, but they took a long time actually publishing the mandate. So it was just this big bluff. And in the meantime, all these employers started voluntarily complying with what they expected the law to eventually be. It's like, well, we're going to get fined if we don't do this. So we're going to go ahead and require all our employees. It's very similar to how the income tax stuff works. Is that how the income tax may have started too? Like, was it a big bluff or was it? Well, you know, sorry, go ahead. That's a good question. I mean, most people assume the income tax started in 1913 with the 16th Amendment, but it actually goes back to 1861 under the Lincoln administration during the Civil War was the first income tax. And uh, Pete Hendrickson is a good author that gives you the history of this in, in his book, Cracking the Code. But that was the federal government trying to raise revenue during the Civil War. Right. And, and if you read that, if you go back and read that law, 1862 law is the one I've seen. I don't think I've seen 1861 law, but they're similar. It's not as tricky as reading the law today. They, they didn't necessarily try to look. I wasn't around in 1861, so I don't know what the public perception was, but you didn't have the marketing and propaganda that you have available now. Right. Like you watch the Super Bowl and how many commercials do you see for like tax, like, you know, turbo tax or whatever or into it. There's this massive propaganda machine that's been around since uh, World War I to encourage people to file income tax and whether it's the law requires it or not. So, yes, there's always been a bit of a bamboozle to it. Even going back to the 1861 law, it says all persons residing in the United States are subject to a tax on. So you can get into, OK, well, what does that mean? Residing in the United States. A lay person might read that and go, oh. Well, I, I live in the United States, so I reside in the United States. I guess I have to file this 1040 return and, and pay tax on my income, right? But on the government's end, like, well, we didn't say that. That's you just making assumptions and just filing your return. So they have a history of writing the words vaguely so as to fool the, the lay person who bothers to read the law. And most people don't even bother to read the law ever. They just right. go along with what their tax professional tells them the law says because no people are busy and they don't want any trouble. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's always been here's the thing the the Congress of the United States has always been boxed in by the fact that they just don't have the authority to impose a general tax on the income of everybody in America. They've never had that authority. It, it would be involuntary servitude if they did. Right. So that instead, they've always used uh, deception to try to dupe people into consenting to it. That's essentially what it is. And they, they get you to not only consent to being liable for tax. But they actually get you uh, to unknowingly accept benefits. That's fundamentally because I get people to argue with me. Oh, it's not contractual because I, I never saw a contract or I didn't get anything out of it. There's all these, you know, people that are familiar with contracts will get will argue that there's all these elements that are missing from the contract. But you know, if you look carefully at, at the way this stuff works, and, and now we can get into reading what the law says, there are acceptance of benefits explained in the Internal Revenue Code, and that is really what's causing people to incur an obligation. So there you have your uh, consideration element of the contract that many people claim is not there. They go, well, I, they can't just say I'm liable just because I signed a piece of paper saying I'm liable. Uh, well, actually, yeah, they can. But that doesn't <laughs> yeah. mean it's but but there's also some substance to what's going on there, because the act of filing that 1040, you are and submitting it to the IRS, you are accepting a certain benefits. And that is under Internal Revenue Code that causes you to incur corresponding obligations 
And those obligations are disclosed in the Internal Revenue Code. You just have to know where to find those. So I can go into specifics on that if you want to. Yeah, I was just going to say, keep going on that, please. All right. So like a 1040, is that's the return they push on everybody, right? That That's the one that uh, used to be available in the post office. You go there, there'd be stacks of them. And now that's just the one, if you get TurboTax or any of these things, they're all built around the 1040 return. Well, the 1040 return, if you uh, get into the regulations under the Internal Revenue Code, it says it's for general use. Okay. And that's another deception right there. They just lead you to believe, oh, this is the return that everybody should be using, except there's this, uh, and this gets into where like, there's these little opt-out provisions if you know where to find them. And it took me a long time to, uh, to find these things. But the, the thing is, the fa- as long as they provide you uh, some type of way of opting out, then it's okay for them to say things like, oh, everybody has to use the 1040. Because you know, down the page in the law, it'll say, oh, there's an exception to that, though. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll put the exception, like they'll bury the exception someplace else so that, you know, you, you can't say that they didn't tell you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's a 1040 return that is uh, under the, according to the regulations is supposed to be the uh, general purposes tax return for individuals. But then they have the 1040 NR, which is made for non-resident aliens. And that is in the same set of regulations and go, oh, this one is for non-resident aliens. And, um, uh, You know, most Americans will immediately go, oh, well, that's not me. That's for foreigners. And so then you got to get into how a non-resident alien is defined and this and that. But getting back to the 1040, what that effectively means is when you file a 1040, you are effectively claiming this status called a United States person. And that's not the same thing as all Americans, because if it was all Americans, they could just write the law that way. So, okay, the tax applies to all Americans. You got to pay it. That's the end of the story, right? You think it would be really simple if that's how it worked and they would just write it that way. But instead, they have this term called United States person. And when you file the the 1040, you are accepting uh, certain benefits that are available only to this United States person status. And one of those benefits is uh, a lower tax rate than what a non-resident alien might have on the same income. All right. Like a non-resident aliens are taxed at a flat 30 percent rate. Now, nobody filing a 1040 pays a 30% tax rate. Like, I think the highest tax bracket is 24%, something like that. So you're getting a break there, in theory, on your tax rate by claiming this status. So can you see right there, there's a benefit. In return for that benefit, you have to report all of your income worldwide to the IRS as gross income subject to tax, including your earnings from your job. That's counted as income, too. So that's the heart of the scam that most people are falling into right there. There's other parts of the scam, but the most common way that people become liable is right there. They're filing a 1040. They're claiming this status that has certain benefits that under the Internal Revenue Code makes them subject contractually because they chose to do it, right? In theory, you chose the Mm -hmm. the 1040 form and you chose to file that and you chose to report. uh, Well, it's not that you choose to report. If you file that 1040, you're obligated to report all income as gross income. That's the contract. And they and they hide that from you because they don't put it in those terms. You're meant to believe that, oh, well, this is what everybody has to do because you're American, except it doesn't say that in the law anywhere. I don't want to get into too much into giving generic advice as to what people should do about that. The main point of my Telegram channel, which I think you're going to put a link to, is mm-hmm. understanding how you get into this trap, right? Yeah. How, how you get into this. And, and because that, once you fully understand how you personally are getting yourself into this, that's your way out. Let's say you decide not to file, which I don't recommend, okay? I don't recommend anybody just go, oh, the hell with this. I'm just not going to file anymore. Even though people might seem to get away with it or they share stories about getting away with it or or whatever. But let's just say you decided to do that. I'm not going to take part in this anymore. I'm going to just not file. Well, the IRS still has that W-2 form that your employer filed reporting that you had gross income. And that's all they need. They can, if you, mm. you know, eventually they will send you a notice asking you to file a return. Like, hey, we have information that leads us to believe that you are required to file a return. So please file a return or explain to us why you think you are not required to file. So there's an opportunity right there to settle the matter. But uh, most people that decide not to file haven't educated themselves enough to know how to respond to that, except with like, screw you, I'm not going to file a return mm. or, you know, or maybe they just ignore it. Right. And so then inevitably, the IRS can just assess a tax anyway, because the W-2 gives them all the information they need, especially if you don't disagree with it. And that's really the big mistake, fundamental mistake that people that don't file returns 
make is that they are they have an opportunity to put their determinations of their income tax liability on the record and they're passing up that opportunity and just allowing the IRS to just take what's on the table and just use that to their advantage. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you said something in there that I want to pull out a little more. Yeah. So this is something okay. that that you I think you wrote in one of your ebooks or the income tax challenge PDF. We'll link to all that in the show notes. But you said it is not a crime to not file a tax return if you sincerely believe you are not clearly required by law to file a tax return. And believe it or not, that is your determination to make and no one else's. So take us more into that thought process of if I don't think that I'm sincere, like if I right, have this right. sincerely held belief that I'm not a taxpayer and I don't have to file a tax return, then is that the end of the road? Yeah, I can't remember exactly how I phrased that, but let me just let me just phrase that a little bit better. Because you can't there is a, such a crime as willful failure to file a return. So I don't want to just uh suggest to anybody that that's not it's not a crime you can just not file and there'll be no consequences because people are charged with willful failure to file a tax return and if they do that for multiple years it's more likely they will just be charged with tax evasion which is a felony. You know, willful failure to file a tax return is just a misdemeanor. But you string together a couple of years, three years, four years, where it becomes a pattern, they can go, okay, well, this person's deliberately not filing because they think they can evade taxes. And now you're talking about felonies for each time you didn't file. So it is, it can be a very serious thing. But the, the key word there is willful. It's willful failure to file. So it's really a matter of if they did prosecute someone and put them on trial, the jury has to be convinced that the, that the failure to file was willful. Does that make sense? It does. And it makes me think of Al Capone back in the day because that was my yeah. that was my first exposure to tax evasion and the quote unquote seriousness of it because you have this gangster who's running around, you know, like this this empire where this is just murdering people, running drugs, you know, prostitution. Right. And just somehow gets busted for tax evasion and it kind of like instills a little bit of fear into you. Like, oh, if they can take him down with that, they can take down everybody. That is absolutely the point. That's absolutely. That's why they bring down Wesley Snipes too. Like, if these rich and powerful people can be brought down, you have no chance. And I'm not sure Al Capone failed to file. I think he filed returns and just didn't report the illegal, probably, uh, yeah, money. He's it was something that like that, and, right. they, and they got him for that. It, which again, Al Al Capone uh, was under contract effectively against the IRS because, and as I explained, the contract for a United States person is that you have to report all income whether it's from legal sources or illegal sources. So assuming that's what happened, I'm not an expert on Al Capone's case, but I believe he was filing returns because he was trying to keep up appearances and he had his, you know, his legitimate businesses and things like that, that he was, that he was running. And he probably reported income from that, but failed to report income from bootlegging alcohol and stuff. And that's mm -hmm. how they got him is because under, under that contract under the internal revenue code, he was required to report all his income. But I mean, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't help Al Capone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? But if, I, but, but if I were going to help, if I were going to get in a time machine and go back and help Al Capone, I would, I would have him uh, look at that contract that he's getting himself into because that everybody enters into these without knowing what they're doing. I don't want to get too much into telling people, you know, how to start to beat this because you shouldn't try to like start to beat this system until you really understand the system. Okay. It's like mm -hmm. trying to play you know, play chess against a chess master. You better, you better know what you're doing before you take them on. Okay. Just because you know, somebody's scamming you, you, you got to really, when, when it's the government like this and they can turn it around on you so easily, it's really, really important to understand what you're doing. That's really, you know, to get back to my background a little bit, I learned a lot from studying the failures of people that have tried to illegally find a way out of income taxes. And people have been trying to do it for decades and they've always failed for the same reason because they didn't recognize this contractual element that I'm talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like when somebody makes arguments like, uh, you're familiar with Erwin Schiff? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Erwin Schiff became, uh, had some books in the eighties, uh, like how to get out of income taxes. And it seemed to Erwin, and this is a very reasonable argument that people, it's a reasonable sounding argument that people make today. Like, well, I go to work at a job. That's, that's just an even exchange of my time and my effort for money. There's no income there. There's no gain there. There's no profit. And that's people that understand that income was traditionally meant to be a, you know, a, a profit or a gain. And it wasn't just everything that comes in. OK. And so Erwin Schiff made this perfectly reasonable argument. He goes, hey, yeah, you, you don't have to report that. You don't have to file a return. And uh, but he didn't understand the way the code is written so that uh, it's assumed that you agreed to treat it as income. 
is, is effectively why that doesn't work. And all these tax arguments, all the arguments that people make against income tax that have, have been shot down, the IRS has a list of positions called frivolous tax positions, just to let you know, just to let the public know. And I, I think everybody should look at that. Uh, it shows you all the different arguments and how they've been shot down in court. They all get shot down for the same reason, because these arguments fail to recognize, you know, it, let's just say a person in, in a particular tax case, okay? Like if you get a, a notice of deficiency against you from the IRS because you didn't file your tax return and you decide to start arguing that the tax is illegal or that it's unconstitutional or, you know, whatever argument you make is not going to be relevant because they've got evidence that you are liable. It's just like if you decided to not pay, if you have a visa card and you run up some charges on it. And you just decide, ah, you know what, this, this is fake money. This is not real money that they're doing. I'm not going to pay it. Well, that's not going to help you. You ran up the charges. You have a liability that you have to deal with. And it doesn't matter if the money is fake or if Visa turns out to be, you know, uh, not an American company or, or whatever your argument is, right? It's, it's all irrelevant because you have an obligation. There's a contract there and there's no court in the world that will just let you just blow off an obligation that you willingly incurred. So David, while we're still in the first hour here, I want to <laughs> define some of the terms so okay. that people better comprehend what these things actually mean in the code or in the law. Okay. I don't know what the right term there is to use there, but I was, you know, thinking of terms like income, gross right. income, because we've already mentioned that obviously several times. So yes. define for us what those terms mean. Just those those two to well, start it's with. In, it's in, it's interesting. You know, the, the tax, uh, the income tax law, the income tax code does not actually define the term income. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a sign that you're being scammed. The income tax law came out, but it was income was uh, always understood to mean uh, gains or profit. And that's how the Supreme Court actually defined the term in the early cases after the after the 16th Amendment in 1913. There was a lot of cases where the definition of income was debated. And at that time, they were not trying to tax working people on their compensation. All right. The tax was primarily aimed at stockholders, people making uh, gains and profit off of uh, investments. OK, and that's traditionally what income was in the 1940s during World War Two. They decided they to control inflation because they were borrowing huge amounts of money to fund the war. They needed to control inflation. So they implemented this wage withholding, which didn't start until 1942, uh, of withholding income tax from workers' pay. And that's really where they devised this kind of contractual language in the Internal Revenue Code where they, where they says, well, you know, compensation for services shall be treated as gross income from sources in the United States or from sources without the United States. So that's really what it is. I mean, wages, yeah, when people argue that wages are not income, in one sense, they're correct. But in the other sense, uh, if you're raising that argument in a tax case, that's going to be thrown out as a frivolous argument. That is probably the most common frivolous argument that people make. And it, it seems to make sense, right? Hey, I, I didn't even exchange my money for my, you know, I got money for my time. Like, you can't tax that. Yeah, they can uh, because of the things that I already talked about where the employer has collected your social security number and they've gotten a W-4 and they file a W-2. All this paperwork creates the illusion that you agreed to have your earnings treated as income. And it isn't actually a profit or a gain, but nonetheless, you've agreed to treat it as federally taxable income. Does that make sense? So that's our definition of income uh, mm -hmm. was arrived at by the courts because Congress was so you know cagey about what income is. They were really hoping, I think, that the American public would just, you know, we use the term income in conversation. It just means everything that comes in. And that's what your average person probably pretty much believes like, well, I, I have to report everything that comes in on my tax return. So income means everything that comes in. It's an income tax. Mm -hmm. It's right there in the name. And so we're taught to just think very simplistically about these things. And, uh, and that's not an accident. That's designed by very sophisticated, diabolically clever legislative draftsmen who anticipated that. They knew they had to write the law very cleverly because they, they knew they didn't have the power to just impose a general tax on everything that came in for everybody. They just simply don't have the power to do that. And that's why to do it, they've had to resort to these deceptive practices, the, the way they write the law and the system they have that, you know, like I said, the employer forces you basically onto the reservation, so to speak, and they manufacture evidence of your liability. That's what your W-2 form that your employer issues is. It's evidence of liability. 
Okay, so that's income. What is gross yeah. income then? Oh, gross income is a uh, statutory term that Congress came up with that uh, it basically is means all income before deductions is what it says in the code. But what they're not telling you is it's all income that is subject to federal tax. Congress doesn't pretend to have the power to tax everybody in the world, right? I think most people will understand that. We're just taxing yeah. people that with some connection to America or so people think. But anyway, no, nobody thinks that Congress is taxing everyone in the world. So when we say gross income in the Internal Revenue Code, when it says gross income means all income from whatever source derived, you know, you, you got to understand that that, OK, that there's some limitations there that they're not explicitly explaining. It can't mean all income. All doesn't mean all. It means income that has some federal nexus of taxation to it, obviously, because this is federal law. Am I making sense? Yeah. So gross doesn't mean all, right? That's what we're well, yeah, about. but yeah, exactly. But the illusion there, all, it just hit me when you said it like gross. Yeah, gross. Oh, that means everything. And, and that's what people are conditioned to think. Oh, I got to put my gross income, like everything that I made. And now I got to look for deductions. And that's how people are conditioned to think. Now I got to go find a really good tax guy that knows all the deductions. And that really is maybe the fundamental difference between my process and the process that people would ordinarily go through with a tax preparer, where the gross income is just automatically assumed to be everything that came in. And the game is to try to find as many deductions and credits as you can to reduce that to, you know, so your taxable income is as low as possible, right? That's what everybody's trying to do with TurboTax or a CPA or anybody that they go to to help with their taxes. They're looking for those write-offs. Whereas my game with my clients is uh, the, the objective is we're, we're not going to just skip over that gross income thing. We're going to look very carefully at your income and the sources and your status. And, and we're going to determine whether this is even gross income in the first place. Because again, gross income does not mean everything that came in necessarily. Gross income means everything that came in that all income that has a federal connection of some kind to it. And for a lot of people, that's nothing, I would guess, right? Well, and, and that's why they have this system to manufacture that connection. You might mm. think that, oh, I don't have anything that's federally connected. But then again, you have an employer that took money out of your paychecks and sent it to Social Security and Medicare, which are federal insurance programs. So right there, you've got a federal connection there. You are earning coverage under those programs and they use that. They can use that as a nexus right there to treat your earnings as, as taxable income. Because after all, you're participating in this federal insurance program and uh, mm -hmm. so that you can get benefits when you retire or if you're disabled, right? So I think people understand you're getting about 8% of your check taken out for those contributions, but there's a bigger price tag than that that they're not telling you about. Like that is actually, if needed, that's the, that can be the basis for making your earnings taxable income for federal tax purposes. So whatever tax you're, you're paying, like income tax, you're paying on your earnings from your job is related to the fact that you're contributing to Social Security and Medicare. And by the way, nobody is really going to their employer, go, hey, I want to make sure I contribute to that Social Security, right? Because most people, I think, today understand that these mm -hmm. things are just black holes. Your money's disappearing into it, and you may not ever see that money again, right? Well, from what I know, you never see what you put into Social Security, for example. You know, you're never going to get out fully what you put into it over the years. So what's the point of that? Not at this point. Yeah, yeah they're completely <laughs> insolvent. And they're taking the money out of your check and using it to pay benefits that are owed to people right now. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're, that money's being socked away. It never has been. It's always just been another, you know, another source of revenue for them to raid when they need it or when they want it. <laughs> uh, so... Let's talk about some of these other terms that I had on my list. Sure. Because I think they're important. You've already mentioned non-resident alien, and then there's the resident alien, and then there's the individual, there's the citizen. There's all of these weird yes. terms they have in there. They sound like they mean the same thing. They sound like they define who you are as a as a human or as a person here. Right. And that term person even is is part of this. So, you know, that's kind of a, a big ask to define all these terms. Go well, ahead. you're right to bring up these definitions because uh, understanding the, the clearly understanding the definitions of certain key terms will unravel the entire scam. And one you didn't bring up, which is uh, United States. The way if you clearly mm -hmm. understand how United States is defined in the various ways they use it in the Internal Revenue Code, that really is the key term for just unraveling the whole thing. Because you're meant to think the United States, every time it's used, means this country that we live in, right? The USA. But legally, that's not how things work. I mean, federal law and state law 
are different jurisdictions. And when you have Congress, when we talk about powers that Congress has, the United States, sometimes they have to limit the definition to reflect the fact that Congress doesn't have general power inside the states. And a lot of people don't understand that either because we're not taught civics anymore. But uh, a lot of people think Congress has some type of umbrella jurisdiction over the entire country, like the way other countries have a a, a central government. That's not how this government works. We have a government of delegated powers where the states took certain things. Okay, federal government, you're going to be in charge of these things like uh, postal service, uh, foreign relations, you know, immigration, banking. But Congress is a is a body of delegated powers. They don't have any kind of general powers in in the states. And I'll give you a good example of that. Back in 1995, there was a Congress passed a gun law that said if you have a gun within a thousand feet of a public school, you know, anywhere in America like that, they made that a federal crime. And someone was charged with the federal under that federal law because they had a, a gun within a thousand feet of a school. And the law was challenged and it made it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court threw the law out. And they didn't throw it out because of Second Amendment or anything like that. They threw it out because Congress has no jurisdiction a thousand feet from a public school in America. That is state territory. A state could pass a law like that, but Congress cannot. Does hmm. that make sense? Yeah, I would have never considered that. But yeah. yes, makes sense. That, that's an illustration. And the Supreme, that was in 1995. It was U.S. v. Lopez. And uh, the Supreme Court explained in that. And we had some good justices on there that understood the Constitution very well. Uh, Clarence Thomas was on there by then and Scalia. And they both explain that, you know, how the first principles like the government, Congress, federal government is a government of delegated powers, and they do not have any general authority inside the states. So what they said there, they didn't mention income tax, but what they said there illustrates my point is that the way people typically believe the income tax works is legally impossible in this country. Mm -hmm. Congress does not have the authority to impose a tax on everybody, you know, not even every employer in America. You know, there has to be some federal nexus of taxation. And that's why they do all this paperwork with the Social Security number and the W-4 and the W-2, because that's how they manufacture liability. Okay, so let's go back to some of those definitions. So uh, United States was on my list. That was kind of on my next thing. United States, that's what we were talking about. So United States is a very important term. And you look at how that term is defined generally in the Internal Revenue Code at 7701, Section 7701, they define the term United States. It's a very odd definition. They define it. They say when do, when used in its geographical sense, the United States means only the states and the District of Columbia. All right. So you read that and you go, oh, well, the states. Well, they're talking about the 50 states. OK, maybe. Yeah, But how do you know when they're using it in the geographical sense? Very good question. And I will answer it for you. They're almost never using it in the geographical sense. So that <laughs> definition is a red herring. Because what they're trying to do is pretend like, I think they're trying to perpetuate this illusion that there's some type of umbrella jurisdiction that Congress has everywhere in America, which is not the case. But they want you to think that, well, I'm in America and I read the Internal Revenue Code and it says it includes the state. So there it is. It's not territorial power that Congress is exercising with the income tax. It is a power they only get via contract. And contracts are typically non-geographical. All right. So it doesn't matter where you are. If you are this United States person and you file a 1040, even if you live overseas, you might be required by law to file a tax return and report all of your income to the IRS as long as you continue to be this United States person. So United States in Internal Revenue Code, especially in the income tax provisions, is almost always describing the federal government itself. And so if you're within the United States, that means that you have some type of contractual connection to them. To, to the federal government. It, it almost never means the geographical area. And even when they do define it geographically, they don't clearly include the 50 states of the union, which makes sense because Congress doesn't have any general power inside the 50 states of the union. Make sense? Yeah, but they have power over that United States. And I'm going to use a layman's term or the normie term, but that U.S. corporation, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the, there is a definition in other titles of United States Code uh, that define the United States as a federal corporation. And that's a good, uh, yeah, it, it could mean any any part of the government, right? And if you think it's federal law, so it makes sense that they're only talking about the federal government as opposed to a, a state government, because the, those are two different things. I mean, they have there's the 10th Amendment that gives preserves the state's sovereignty. It's 9th or 10th Amendment. I can't remember at the moment. 
but we have divided sovereignty in, in this country. So the federal jurisdiction and then there, each state has its own jurisdiction. And these are foreign jurisdictions to each other. That's an interesting point because, you know, that is why I wanted to define these other terms like resident alien, non-resident alien, because those sound like, I mean, why is the word alien in this? You know, that's that's an interesting term because it looks like a lien when you look at it legally. Well, you know, they, they do define these terms, but if you look at the term that is used, well, it's interesting because if you look at section one imposing the income tax, like section one of the Internal Revenue Code, there's no mention of citizens or resident aliens or non-resident aliens in that. It's just individuals. It imposes a tax on the taxable income of individuals. So that's a that's a key term too. It's not an income tax, it's an income, it's a tax on taxable income. Um, well, so, that, okay. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it's, it, it's kind of hard to unravel, but my point is that they don't mention citizens in the, the code, uh, in section one, imposing the tax. You have to go to the regulations under the code and there they explain like, okay, well, taxable income for a citizen or resident of the United States means all income. And for a non-resident alien, it's only income from sources connected to the United States. How do you know which of these buckets you fall in? Or if you fall in any of them. That is, um, man, that's the, <laughs> well, you just have to learn how to carefully read the law. And that's something I, I teach my clients how to do and, and guide them through it. And, you know, it, it can't be my conclusions. It has to be your conclusions. You know, it's difficult reading the law because you have to, there's, there's ground rules for reading the law. Words don't automatically mean what you think they commonly mean. You know, that's why we're talking about these definitions, because when you say, OK, a non-resident alien is subject to tax only on sources from the United States, a lot of people will read that as, OK, so if it's from anywhere in America. No, that doesn't mean from anywhere in America. It means sources within the United States. This is federal law. We're talking about sources from the federal United States, because there's no reason to think that Congress can tax anybody for income that came from any state. Like in, you got income from Wisconsin. Oh, Congress is going to tax you on that. Well, how? They don't have any power to do that. Maybe Wisconsin can tax that income, but where does Congress get the authority to do that? There's some ground rules for reading the law and understanding it, but one of the biggest ones is understanding what the limitations on Congress's power are. And that's the subject of uh, that bonus report that I have uh, linked on my website. I, I spend a lot of time explaining why Congress's power or that Congress's power is limited and what the repercussions of that are. But the bonus report explains why that is. You know, it just goes back to the Constitution and how Congress only exists as a it's a creation of the states and they only have the powers that have been delegated to them. Right. And they have power over their own property. Like the federal government has power over its own property, obviously. Right. Like the post office, that's their property. A mailbox is federal property. Basically, they dupe you into accepting federal benefits. And so now it's you get treated as though you're federal property. That's how the scam works. So does that opt in and, and that sort of contractual agreement, does that then make you a federal quote unquote citizen? I wouldn't put it in those terms because it doesn't have any application outside of income tax. It's a year to year thing. This is something that people in the patriot or truther community sometimes get confused about. They think there's some overarching contract. If you're a federal citizen, now you don't have any rights and that kind of stuff. Everything's very specific, though. The way contracts actually work are they're more specific than that, okay? Like all the all the, uh, the benefits that you're accepting from calling yourself a United States person when you file a 1040 are explained in the Internal Revenue Code, and they are very specific. Uh, you get a lower tax rate than a non-resident alien might get. You're entitled to a standard deduction, which non-resident aliens cannot get. Uh, you can file a joint return with your spouse, which non-resident aliens can't do. So those are all privileges that you're giving yourself access to by claiming the status of United States person, which includes a citizen or resident alien of the United States. That's how they define United States person in the Internal Revenue Code at 7701. They don't use those terms separately. Usually it's all, you always see it all together like that, like citizen or resident alien of the United States. Like it's one big long term, just like that, because it really makes no difference. Someone who, who files a 1040 is saying, I'm either one of these things and you're treated the same. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And that's why I wanted to define these terms because they yeah, all yeah. sound the same to me. I don't know what they mean. Well, I'll tell you, they don't, they don't define the term citizen expressly, but it is defined functionally. If you look at like 
you know, if you look at the regulations under Section 1 of the Internal Revenue Code, it's 26 CFR 1.1, they explain functionally a definition for citizen. That is a person who has agreed to report all income as gross income to the IRS. So it has a functional definition, but they don't really define what it is. They do say it's, a, I think, under 1.1, the regulations under 1.1 at, at C, they say who is a citizen. And it's a, more of a clarification than a definition. But it says a citizen is a person born or naturalized in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction. So that's their definition for citizen, which is a little bit weird. I mean, people are going to read that and go, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an American citizen, so that means me. Except they, use, they say its jurisdiction. So they said the United States, born and naturalized in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction. So it's not a there, it's an its. And that, to me, indicates really clearly we're talking about a singular entity. We're talking about the federal government being subject to its jurisdiction. Well, and I want to still define what a non-resident alien is, as you understand it, because one, it does play a role in kind of what you do with your consulting. And we can get more into that in the second hour. But I just want right. to define that term because it seems to be it's something that's dangling out there that, you know, like you said earlier, it sounds like, oh, that's a foreigner. That's somebody from another country. That's definitely what they want you to think. Uh, but if you understand that you're, you're just talking about somebody, it's a catch-all term, actually. Non-resident alien was never actually defined in the Internal Revenue Code until 1984. But the term was there was a non-resident alien return form for decades before that. You know, they, they think they first came out with a non-resident alien tax return in 1938. So it was a thing. Uh, non-resident alien is a there's a famous Supreme Court case involving an American, Frank Bruce Shaver versus uh, Union Pacific Railroad in 1916. And that was an American man. He was mentioned in a treasury decision issued after that decision. And he was referred to as a non-resident alien, even though he's an American. So it's interesting. It's, it's a catch-all status. And it just basically means anyone who is not a citizen or resident alien of the United States. <laughs> so that may not be helpful because you have to understand what a citizen or resident alien in the United right. States is. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at. Except, yeah, well, except, uh, you know, what I was saying is a citizen or resident alien of the, of the United States is defined functionally as a person who is, has to report all income to the IRS. They file a 1040 return and they partake of the, the benefits of a, of a lower tax rate than non-resident aliens get on some income. They get a standard deduction. So it's really just a, a contract status you can think of. And a non-resident alien is just anyone who doesn't elect that contract status. And, right. and that might include foreigners, but it could also include Americans. Uh, that's a big tenet of, of what I teach and what I've used to uh, opt out myself and, and clients is that Americans have a right to file as non-resident aliens. Yeah, which was news to me. I had not heard that until I joined your Telegram group and yeah. has started to watch and, or I guess, read some of the conversation that was happening there. And then I was, I was kind of blown away by that. And yeah, it sounds crazy, right? It's like, what do you does. mean I can yeah. file as a non-resident alien? And, it, and, it, and it's meant to sound crazy. Um, but, you know, the tax return form, if you take a look at a 1040 NR tax return form, uh, they don't have this on here anymore. But up until 20, up until 2018, they had boxes on page one of the form that you could check to tell them what type of non-resident alien you are and national of the United States, or I think they say U.S. national on the form. U.S. national was one of the choices. So that's an American. Yeah, that, yes, <laughs> and, it is. And, and it was right there on the form. But it, that box has been taken away, you said, right? Well, yeah, they took it away because mainly because they, they got rid of uh, personal exemptions in 2018. So now there's no reason to ask anybody like what type, because it, the, all those boxes, it was really about sorting out who was entitled to a certain level of personal exemptions and or not. That was their excuse anyway. But, you know, just because they changed, by the way, just because they changed the form doesn't mean the law changed. You know, it still says in the Internal Revenue Code at uh, Section 873B3, it mentions nationals of the United States as being non-resident aliens. So right there in the law, you have, okay, so now we know from that that Americans a U.S. national, that's an, a national of the United States is an American. So now we know that Americans can be non-resident aliens. So then what's the argument against, you know, if they want to say that you can't file as a non-resident alien, like what? why? Why can't I? It says right here that Americans can file as non-resident alien. If one American can do it, then every American has to be able to do it or, or we have an equal protection of the laws problem. Right. We're all entitled to equal protection of the laws as against the federal government and against the states. 
Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And before we transition over to the second hour, let's leave the free audience with just like kind of a, an in a nutshell definition of what this term lawful avoidance actually means. Right. And because that'll tee up the rest of the, the conversation. Excellent. For the... I got the term lawful avoidance from uh, as opposed to tax evasion, you know, and some people try to equate the two. But the Supreme Court explained in a case in 1935 to Gregory V. Helvering, they said a taxpayer, uh, the right of a taxpayer to use lawful means to reduce their tax liability or to altogether avoid their tax liability cannot be doubted. So that is a right that you absolutely have. And that's an important thing for people to realize. That's a might be shocking for some people, but this, you absolutely you have no obligation to you know maximize your taxes. You have every right to use whatever lawful means are available to reduce your tax as low as legally possible. Okay, and that's really what absolutely everybody tries to do with their income tax, right? And that's why you get TurboTax. That's why you go to CPA. That's why you uh, get a, a tax return preparer because you're trying to pay as little as possible. That's why you take all the write-offs. So it's just really a matter of degree. What I do is just take that to the maximum degree where we recognize the ability to arrange your affairs so that you can get your tax down to, that anyone can get their tax to zero just by um, either arranging their affairs or recognizing that uh, the items of income that they have are not necessarily included in their gross income. Indeed. And that, I mean, we'll talk more about this in the, in the second hour, but that it's quite the affair. It's quite the process. It's quite the undertaking. But at the end of the day, you know, it's probably worth it. So tell people before we go for the free audience, tell people where they can find you and your work, your website, your Telegram channel and all that. The Telegram channel, there's an invite link and it's a lot of digits and things. I don't, I don't know it off the top of my head. Maybe you can put that in the, in oh, the yeah, comments. Oh yeah, for sure. But for sure. you can invite your audience to the Telegram link where there's a lot of good material there. We can brush up on this stuff. But my website is no thanks IRS uh, slash family guardian. Uh, you're going to put the website in there, right? Yeah. Okay. Because it, it's no thanks IRS, uh, I think slash family guardian dot org. Yeah. No thanks IRS dot fam guardian dot org. That's it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Don't know my own website address. <laughs> That's okay. Not a problem. And there you have it. My thanks again to David William. Please be sure to check out his website and his Telegram group. Both are linked in the show notes. I tried to link a PDF called the Income Tax Challenge in the show notes as well, but I couldn't find it hosted online anywhere. But it is accessible via the Telegram group under their new member resources or in the pinned messages. It's probably the best introductory read on the subject without just diving directly into the Internal Revenue Code. Unless you want to do that too, well then by all means, knock yourself out. What to make of the first hour here? Well, our goal here was to lay some groundwork and debunk some common tax myths and establish some definitions, because those are the key things we need to comprehend here. What do these words actually mean? What are some preconceived notions that, from David's experience, are or at least appear to be false? And we had to qualify him, as you heard in the beginning, because beyond the debunking and dispelling and defining, there's another D word that's more important than any of that, and of course, you know what that is. And so I'm curious how your discernment bone feels right now. Is it tingling with trust or shaking with skepticism? Or maybe you don't have enough information yet and you're still in that state of pure curiosity. Now, I do want to make a distinction between legal and lawful for those unaware as well, because David considers what he does to be lawful avoidance of income tax, which to me implies something beyond legal process, something more spiritual, something more in line with capital G God's law. And at first I kind of balked at the use of the word lawful here as David uses it, but I kept it in because that is how he refers to it. And we got into something in the second hour that made me think, well, maybe this is lawful avoidance after all. Even if it does involve a better comprehension of corporate policies and lowercase g god laws. And maybe you can tell as well that David prefers a more spontaneous conversation. He's kind of hard to nail down and keep on track. And I can tell you that I felt a bit discombobulated at times here in the first hour. Because I like these chats to be focused so that we can present as much quality information and conversation as possible. Especially in this lawful slash legal space where I have to assume the average listener knows absolutely nothing about the subject. And I love that word discombobulated. I so rarely get to use it in a sentence. It's the only reason I wrote this paragraph, to be honest. Beyond that, I hope that you learned something new, even if it was just that something like this is possible. Because let's face it, if you're a spiritual person and you heard this, you already know all things are possible. You already know that reality is malleable, flexible, able to be deconstructed and reconstructed in a matter of moments. 
And who's to say that the ink that forms the words on the paper these legal constructs are written on? Who's to say that the right mindset and the right magic can't deconstruct and reconstruct that? Anyway, in the second hour, David and I discussed the W-8-B-E-N form and employer withholding, business liability, legal fictions, the straw man as a frivolous tax argument, courts of equity and evidence-based arguments, W-4 exemptions and self-assessments, spiritual strength versus fear-based mentalities and their role in all of this, rebellious energy and the income tax as a tenant of the Communist Manifesto, the emperor and his lack of clothing, and the shift in mindset needed to pursue this. So if you're keen and feeling generous, head over to the Patreon or the Substack, and for $7 a month, you can hear another hour with David and another hour with all of our guests, plus sporadic bonus content as well. Any and all support is greatly appreciated and much needed. Anyway, it's about time for me to reconstruct and deconstruct some steak and sauerkraut, so ramblers, let's get rambling. Until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority.